Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Thomas DiLorenzo, and he will be lecturing uh, today on monopoly and competition. Tom? You, you shouldn't applaud before you hear what I have to say. You might not like it. That's uh, got things backwards. Uh, monopoly and competition. Uh, well, it sounds like a pretty simple topic. Uh, almost all of you have taken a course in microeconomics, uh, uh, or at least read something about microeconomics and think you know something about it. Uh, but what I'm going to do uh, partly is talk about uh, the uh, historical evolution uh, of the idea of competition and monopoly uh, in a context of the role the Austrian school has played. And I, I wrote up just a, a simple definition of how... Uh, Austrians think of competition, and uh, this is a good short definition of competition as a, a dynamic, rivalrous, entrepreneurial discovery process, and that's a short sentence, but uh, I think it really says it all about how um, Austrians have always thought of uh, competition. It's dynamic, meaning it's, it goes, it's ongoing, never-ending, it's evolutionary, uh, it's rivalrous. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means competition includes price cutting, uh, differentiating of products, uh, mergers, the uh, the uh, uh, spinning off of of firms that were once merged, and it turns out that uh, the merger didn't work out, didn't cut costs, and make more money after all. That's a part of the, co the competitive process, and uh, it's entrepreneurial. And uh, you'll you've heard from uh, Peter Klein already about about entrepreneurship. And so, of course, Austrians uh, study entrepreneurship. Unlike uh, the mainstream of the economics profession, they usually says almost nothing about it. If you look at the microeconomics books and you look up entrepreneur or entrepreneurship in the, in the, the index, uh, there's usually a paragraph or two or maybe a picture of somebody, of Bill Gates or somebody like that. And that's about it. There's no real serious uh, studying about it. And it's a discovery process. Um, uh, and what is meant by this is that... Uh, that the market is a process by which uh, firms discover what works and what doesn't, what consumers like and what they don't like. It's how uh, consumers uh, discover uh, what they like, what products uh, will make their lives better, what are the best deals for them. And, uh, and that's an important part of this definition because it says that uh, there's, there's no expert, there's no central planner, there's no economist who can tell us what's efficient for us. We discover these things. We discover these things in the marketplace. For example, there's no, uh, there's no way for an economist or anybody to tell us what the, uh, the optimal or official, uh, efficient organization of an industry is, what the size of an industry, you know, uh, in terms of economies of scale or anything like that. The market tells us that. No one uh, can, cannot guess uh, the market. The market gives us this information. And so uh, that's just a, a short definition of how the Austrians think of competition as an ongoing process. And this, this uh, way of thinking started at least with Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. That's how Adam Smith uh, uh, thought of competition. And that lasted for quite a long time, uh, this, this, the way of thinking about competition. And <clears throat> I, think, I think I'll start uh, giving you an example of uh, there's a, a, an article that I uh, wrote uh, many years ago co-authored with uh, Jack High, and it was published in a journal called Economic Inquiry. And uh, we were interested in what uh, the economics profession had to say about the, uh, the subject of competition and antitrust, antitrust regulation or anti-monopoly regulation. At the time, the first U.S. government federal antitrust law was enacted. This was the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. And so we wanted to know, well, what, the, what were professional economists saying at the time about these antitrust laws and, and how did um, their view of competition form their opinions of the anti-monopoly law, this new anti-monopoly law. And what we found was that, one, we were able to survey the entire American economics profession, every single person who had a job as, a, as an economist, and it was really only like a couple of dozen people. There weren't, there were that many, you know, nowadays uh, it's much larger. But there was even an old article published in the American Economic Review in 1960. I think it was called the American Economics Club, something like that, 
by uh, uh, an author named Coates, C-O-A-T-S, and, um, and he wrote about this. It was like a very small club of the, the Americans who had you know, really degrees in economics and who had earned a living as an economist. So we were able to survey the entire population of the economics profession, and we found that uh, uh, every one of them was uh, opposed to the whole idea of antitrust regulation uh, as a matter of principle. They thought it was inherently incompatible with uh, competition as they understood it inherently. It wasn't just that the way it had been uh, implemented uh, was bad and could be improved upon. They thought it was inherently a bad idea and it could never uh, be consistent with competition. Mm -hmm. I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, the co-founder of uh, the American Economic Association, Richard T. Ely, who himself was a uh, famous statist. He was a progressive uh, if you've ever read any of uh, Murray Rothbard's writings on the progressives and their role in World War I, uh, he says a lot of uh, uh, uncomplimentary things about Richard T. Ely in, in there. But Ely was the co-founder of the American Econ Economic Association. And, and by the way, the, uh, the founding statement of the uh, American Economic Association, this was, I think it was 1885, the year 1885, said that uh, capitalism or laissez-faire is uh, unsound in morals and unsafe in practice. Uh, that was the founding statement of the American Economic Association. <laughs> and, uh, and, and people criticize von Mises as being an extremist because he never joined that organization. You know, what, you know, what an extremist he was. And so anyway, even Richard T. Ely said this about, it was the late 19th century and, uh, and what is happening is technology is changing, uh, there, there are, uh, for the first time ever, there are large, large industries with economies of scale, uh, producing steel and cement and steel rails and all sorts of products with, uh, uh, you know, the costs going down and down and down and prices going down and down and down. And there are mergers. Corporate mergers, uh, was another route to, uh, becoming larger and, uh, achieving economies of scale, lower cost per unit of production. And this was going on in the U.S., uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and uh, when this was founded, when the AEA was founded. And here's what Ely said. He said, uh, large-scale production is a thing which by no means necessarily signifies monopolized production. Uh, the, the other co-founder was John Bates Clark, whose name is up here on the wall uh, somewhere. Uh, and he wrote in 1888 that the notion that industrial combinations would be, destroy competition should not be too hastily accepted. And that was, that was sort of the mildest view uh, we found. Uh, one of the founders of the University of Chicago uh, economics program was a man named Herbert Davenport. And he said uh, that only a few firms in an industry where there are economies of scale does not require the elimination of competition. Uh, another sort of co-founder of the Chicago School, uh, James Lachlan, said that even when a combination, merged companies, is large, a rival combination may give the most spirited competition. And we, the same things were said by Irving Fisher, uh, Edwin R.A. Seligman, who was a, another famous early 20th century economist, and, and on and on. And so we, and we document all this uh, from Yale to Princeton, the University of Chicago, all the, the major universities where economists uh, were at the time. Uh, they all said the same thing. And uh, the reason uh, uh, for this was that they viewed competition like the Austrians do. They viewed competition like Adam Smith did a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurship. So when they looked out there and they saw all these mergers happening, they saw uh, economies of scale developing in, in, in steel and cement and other major industries, they weren't alarmed by it. They didn't think, uh, as Karl Marx predicted, that uh, there would be one giant corporation ruling over the entire planet. That, that was what uh, Marx eventually said, that uh, there would be merger after merger after merger until finally there was only one corporation. That's the Marxian view. They, they thought that was crazy, that, you know, that sort of thing. The competition doesn't work like that. And so they're basically Austrians. This all changed eventually. The, uh, this all changed beginning around the 1920s or 30s, and uh, the, the idea of competition changed. And so uh, rather than this definition of competition essentially uh, carrying the day, uh, we had the, uh, the definition of competition that uh, you've all been exposed to if you've ever taken a course in microeconomics, and it was an equilibrium definition. You see, this is a, a dynamic process, the Austrian view. Uh, disequilibrium is more the normal state of affairs in the world. 
but uh, it wasn't too susceptible to mathematical modeling. And so with the, with the advent of the mathematization of the economics profession, uh, the profession apparently thought it would be more scientific looking to have a different theory of competition, and that's when the so-called theory of perfect competition was invented. And, and, and so what does competition mean under that theory uh, as of the 1930s? Uh, well, you've seen all these assumptions, such as homogeneous products, many firms, perfect information, I'll call it info. Uh, there are different combinations of these, uh, free entry, and homogeneous prices also. Uh, different textbooks might have a few different things, but those are, you've all seen some of these things, homogeneous products and prices. And so this, this was developed as the benchmark of competition uh, in an equilibrium situation. Uh, not only are uh, prices homogeneous, everyone charges the same thing, but they're all equal to marginal cost. Uh, and so uh, so for years and years and years, uh, the government regulators have gone on witch hunts trying to find a divergence between price and marginal cost that lasts more than a short time. And if it does, then you may be the target of a of an antitrust lawsuit, you, you know, your company. And uh, it, got, it got to the extent that... Um, General Motors, for several decades, instructed its uh, management uh, to never, ever get more than a 45% market share because they thought even if they got it by having the best cars and the cheapest cars, uh, that would be bad because they would probably be uh, uh, sued by the federal government for violating the antitrust laws because they had too much of a market share. And, uh, and of course, if people like their cars a lot, well, you might see long periods of time where they're able to charge a price uh, above marginal cost. Uh, but that's but that was the theory, and so this became the new benchmark, and it became uh, this equilibrium condition. That in, in equilibrium, this is supposed to be true, not uh, not always, um, but uh, but in equilibrium. And uh, Hayek addressed this There's, as far as reading goes on this. If you want to introduce yourself to the Austrian view of competition, uh, there's one essay that Hayek wrote uh, entitled The Meaning of Competition, and it's in his little book, Individualism and Economic Order, which is for sale downstairs, and it's one of the essays. And it's, it's, it's a good, good book to buy. Uh, if, if you want to know the Hayekian view of the world, uh, that, that's the book to buy first, I would think, because it has this famous essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, in there. And that's what Hayek is most known for, is the so-called knowledge problem. And this view of competition here, the meaning of competition. And also, Israel Kirzner's book, Competition and Entrepreneurship, is a classic in the Austrian uh, worldview. And also, uh, uh, Murray Rothbard's Chapter 10 of uh, Man, Economy, and State is a, is a great uh, uh, technical exposition, exposition of uh, the Austrian view of competition. And so, uh, well... Hayek's commentary on in the meaning of competition is an analysis of these this new theory, you know, new as of the 1930s. And uh, I'll just read you one paragraph or a couple of paragraphs of what he says about this. He says this, quote, This theory throughout assumes that state of affairs already to exist, which, according to the truer view of the older theory, the process of competition tends to bring about. And that if the state of affairs assumed by the theory of perfect competition ever existed, it would not only deprive of their scope all the activities which the verb to compete describes, but would make them virtually impossible. So in other words, the, under perfect competition, there is no competition. It's all, it's all done with. It's all, it's all in equilibrium. And uh, the, the second little passage I'll read to you from Hayek, he says, uh, quote, How many of the devices adopted in ordinary life to that end would still be open to a seller in a market in which so-called perfect competition prevails. I believe that the answer is exactly none. Advertising, under, price undercutting, and improving or differentiating the goods and services produced are all excluded by definition. Perfect competition means indeed the absence of all competitive activities." End quote. And so beginning around the 1930s, the economics profession 
adopted uh, a view of competition that ruled out competition, essentially. And uh, I'll give you a, an example from the horse's mouth, Paul Samuelson, here. I don't know, if, I don't know, you might not, you probably only the front row can read this, but, so don't, but don't worry about it. I'll read it for you. Uh, this is a, a page from Paul Samuelson's uh, famous textbook, the 1958 edition that I pulled off the shelf over here. I Xerox that just so you don't think I'm just making this all up, so you can actually see it's right. You, you know, you can go find it yourself. The 1958 edition. Samuelson's book was first published in 1948, and it was the biggest selling economics textbook in the world for 40 years after that. And so, to the extent that people learned something about competition and the way economists think about competition, this was overwhelmingly uh, the book. And so, and this is a chapter where he talks about this. Uh, he says, a perfect competitor is one who can sell all he wishes at the going market price, uh, okay, but is unable in any appreciable degree to raise or depress the market price. And by definition, a perfectly competitive industry is one made up exclusively of numerous perfect competitors. In all likelihood, it has some kind of organized auction mechanism uh, there. And so then he goes on to say, well, how does this fit with the real world? How competitive is the real world? And he says, uh, you know, notice how strict this definition is. Well, yeah, it, is. it rules out all competition, all real competition. And, he, and then he says, did you ever hear of an auction market for razor blades or toothpaste or cigarettes? And so he's saying, well, no, you know, we don't have, there's no like auction barn for razor blades. And therefore, uh, it's not competitive. It's monopolistic. It must be by definition. And he, he, he goes on to produce a list of all sorts of products, razor blades, toothpaste, uh, cotton, natural gas, all these things, wheat. And then he goes down to the list and he says, well, when you go down the list, quote, I'm quoting, you'll find that only potatoes, tobacco, wheat, and cotton come within our strict definition of perfect competition. And so in the American economy, uh, you as a consumer, you're safe if you're eating potatoes, smoking cigars, eating bread, and wearing cotton blue jeans. But otherwise, you're the victim of monopoly, is, is sort of the, the, uh, the thing that he's saying. And, and he even gets this wrong. He even, gets, even this is wrong, because at the time he wrote this, the agricultural industries like potatoes, tobacco, wheat, were all cartelized by the U.S. Department of Agriculture with all of its programs paying farmers for not growing tobacco and for and, and acreage allotments that were started during the Great Depression and things like that. And so, so these, these were actually monopolistic industries uh, they're all protected by tariffs. And so, uh, so in other words, Samuelson totally misled uh, uh, generations of students in terms of the definition of, uh, of monopoly. And what this is, it's an example of what, uh, I think it was Harold Demsetz who coined the phrase nirvana fallacy. This has nothing to do with that uh, heavy metal band. Nirvana, the nirvana fallacy. Uh, the economist Harold Demsetz wrote an article in the Journal of Lawn Economics way back around 1970, 1969, around there, uh, about this uh, phenomenon of the nirvana fallacy. And what it is basically is that uh, the practice by economists of, of taking this, this model, the competitive model, and saying, well, this is perfection. You know, a perfect world, many firms, free entry, and, and so forth, and then comparing it to the real world, like Samuelson just did and saying, aha, the real world is not perfect, the markets fail. And, uh, and of course, the reason why it's a fallacy is because, you know, if you compare anything to utopian perfection, anything is going to fail, of course. And so that's why I've always thought that the whole study of competition by the mainstream of the economics profession is this fraudulent. So it's, the nirvana fallacy is just a, a gross fraud uh, uh, to, to, to engage in this type of behavior uh, and, and especially when you when you uh, look at yourself as a policy advisor, advising governments to uh, to prosecute companies because they're not perfect, under um, just under a theory, under this theory, and that went on for many many years. And so, uh, if you look uh, if you look at some of these uh, these assumptions, of course, homogeneous products. Uh, this is not taken as seriously anymore. Uh, but uh, remember, I'm talking about this historically uh, as well as uh, just for present-day uh, relevance. And so 
I mean, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of that was that when once this was developed, once this model was developed, and uh, homogeneous products were said to be the, the one of the benchmarks of competition, then the theories of monopolistic competition were developed by Joan Robinson and Edward Chamberlain. And uh, in uh, those of you, some of you are familiar with this. And so, a monopolistic competition means that uh, well, yeah, you have many firms, so that that assumption holds, but they all differentiate their products. Don't they? And so, and no two products are exactly alike. Uh, even if they are physically alike, they could be perceived as being different by advertising. So the image of a product, even if the exact same black tire for your car, the image might be different, and that's a differentiation. And so, uh, the theory went, uh, well, when you think about it, uh, just about everything in the world is uh, monopolistic because the, it's all different uh, in the eyes of the consumers, either physically or uh, mentally. It's uh, different, and so uh, and, and and I've read you know I've read a lot of the articles in the economics literature uh, from this time when this was all being developed, and and it's very easy to get the impression of a lot of the writers that they were gleeful about this, that they were that they, they had been sitting there for years uh, just upset about the fact that they didn't have. Uh, a weapon with which to to beat on capitalism, and here it was. They finally found it. And Joan Robinson and Edward Chamberlain were British statists, and so they so they developed this whole apparatus of monopolistic competition, and uh, and as a result, you know, even the British government took this very seriously, and they and they actually tried to uh, force uh, homoge homogeneity in housing and in some other industries uh, in, in the world, in. Uh, and what this also led to was uh, eventually in the economics profession was suspicion of innovation, suspicion of innovation as being uh, antisocial or, or monopolistic. And the way in which this came about was, if you look at this, this is the standard uh, mainstream textbook uh, monopoly diagram here. And, uh, and the Nirvana fallacy was put into play here. And this is a standard monopoly diagram with a downward sloping demand curve. Here's marginal revenue and a, a constant cost industry with marginal cost and average cost being horizontal. And here's the monopoly price, PM. And what, are the monopoly, what does the monopoly do according to the standard model? Well, they, they produce this level of output. That's the profit maximizing level of output, which is less than would be produced in this industry if there was competition. If there was competition, then marginal cost, this would be the sum of the marginal cost curves of all the firms or the supply curve. And so this would be the equilibrium here if there were competition. And so the story goes, well, uh, uh, what do monopolies do? They restrict output. That's, that's a bad thing because there, there's a deadweight loss. There's a loss of consumer surplus there. And, and so uh, how this was applied to, to the homogeneous product assumption is that if there's an innovation, the creation of a new product, uh, for a while you're a monopoly. Uh, you're the sole seller. By definition, you're the sole seller of that, of that product. And so you're restricting output. And so there, there were all sorts of uh, recommendations, and some of them uh, went through by the government, to force innovators to share their secrets with the, com the competition. In fact, uh, if any of you paid any attention several years ago to the Microsoft antitrust case, that's exactly what the government wanted to try to force Microsoft to do, to, to give away its uh, source code, to uh, you know, put it online so that anybody could have it uh, for Windows. Just, just as uh, it would be like forcing uh, Coca-Cola to, to publish uh, the recipe for Coca-Cola on the Internet. Uh, you know, no one has been able to figure it out all these years but, uh, but these sorts of things were actually uh, uh, proposed for a long, long time. And like I said, that was exactly what the, the government was trying to do with, uh, with Microsoft, force them to give away their trade secrets uh, in the name of efficiency, in the name of competition. And, and why this is a nirvana fallacy is that uh, uh, the way to look at this is, you know, here we are without the innovation that created the new product. It's zero. So at zero, there's no consumer surplus at all because this product doesn't exist. No one benefits from it. The inventor invents the product. The entrepreneur invents the product, creates the product, puts it on the market. So, and it sells this quantity, QM. So there's all this, all this consumer surplus here that is benefiting consumers. And so that's the real comparison. The real comparison is from zero, which is where you were, to the amount of trade that exists that benefits buyers and sellers. 
Okay, but the Nirvana fallacy is to say, well, let's compare the actual level of output, Q, to the level of output that would exist if everybody in the world simultaneously had the idea of the inventor and put 10,000 uh, replicas of it on the market, perfect competition. And, and of course, that's, that's that comparing the real world to utopia again. And, uh, and that's, so that's why uh, it's called a fallacy. It's a, and so, uh, you know, innovation and R&D are good things um, uh, by this view. And so this kind of nonsense went on uh, in government circles for a long time, trying to crack down on innovation. There was a, an economist named Dennis Mueller who uh, used to be a very big name in, uh, in the field of industrial organization. He actually wrote a, a, a paper in the, uh, the Economic Journal, the British uh, Academic Journal, uh, recommending uh, that the U.S. Congress create a new committee to uh, to determine which types of R&D should be permitted in the private sector and which should not, because he thought he would be able to tell which type would lead to monopoly and which would not lead to monopoly. And so, and of course, if that were to happen, uh, uh, this crowd probably could guess pretty easily what would happen is that companies would lobby Congress to prohibit their competitors' R&D and to allow their R&D. And so that, and that was, was what would create monopoly power. That would create monopoly power. And so, uh, and so anyway, that's, that's one reason why that, a couple of reasons why that's a bad idea. And uh, this, this is a, uh, again, probably nobody can read that. It's, not, it's too, too light in here. But uh, I, I'm just putting this up again so that you know I'm not making these numbers up. Uh, this is uh, the annual report from the Dallas Fed, 1998. And they did a, there's, a, there's an economist at the Dallas Fed named Michael Cox, who's a pretty good free market economist. And uh, I like to think that he must be a spy for us. He works at the Fed, and he's, and, uh, and, but he's done some really interesting uh, research over the years. That's, the Fed publishes it, and then he's published a couple books out of it. And uh, this was the annual report, and it was about, what it was about is uh, uh, mass customization, the integration of mass production in manufacturing with computers, with the computer revolution, the high-tech revolution, and how it, it's now possible in today's world, and as of 1998, uh, to make money in a lot of products for companies to be very profitable producing relatively low volume uh, of products for niche markets. Uh, whereas in the old days, 50 years ago, uh, you know, the way to make money in manufacturing was uh, produce a zillion replicas of the exact same thing and get economies of scale in your factory and low cost, and that's how you make a lot of money in manufacturing. But the integration of technology, computer technology and manufacturing has made it uh, this all a different world. In, in other words, th there's been an explosion in product differentiation because of this. Uh, any of you, I don't know, maybe some of you have bought a car online. If you, if I wanted to buy a car after this class, I could just go online, uh, pick the car I want. I could pick all the all the uh, the add-ons that I want. Just click click here. Uh, then I could finance it online, put it online, and it'd take me about 15 minutes, and the factory will make it for me and deliver in, in, a, in a week or two. Uh, that's, that was just unthinkable 30 or 40 years ago, but that's what this is about. And, you, and so what they did is in some of these tables, it's just, you know, vehicle models in the early 70s compared to the late 90s, 140 versus 260, um, uh, Magazine titles, 339 versus 790. Even books, 40,000 versus 77,000. Even Pop-Tarts. There were only three brands of Pop-Tarts in the early 70s. Could you imagine that? Uh, and uh, the, the sin, sin, one of the sins of capitalism. Uh, and then tw 29, you know, thankfully, by the late 90, 1990s, there were 29. Mouthwashes, 15 to 66. And, and you know, they, so they have numerous tables that, uh, that show this. Uh, this is all outdated. I think beer is in this one. Yeah, only 25 brands of beer in the year in the 1980 uh, versus 187 by 1998. It's probably 1877 by now, or more than that. And so, so what this is about is this is mass proliferation of uh, of product variety. And why is this happening? Well, it's happening because of competition. It's not happening. It's not happening because the world is is becoming monopolistic. And so and I think this is one of the things that has uh, softened the critiques of homogeneous, you know, unhomogeneous products. And uh, I don't think uh, it's, it's really ridiculous to see a Dennis Mueller today or someone like him writing an article in the Economics Journal calling for government regulation of product variety. Uh, although you do see sociologists and uh, uh, 
Uh, I had, uh, the, my university hires a number of left-wing lawyers to teach uh, businesses how to be socially responsible. And uh, one of their speakers that they brought into the campus uh, a year or two ago uh, just uh, stood up there for 45 minutes and whined and moaned about how there are too many items on menus at restaurants. And that's one of the failures of capitalism is uh, there's too much stuff on it. We waste too much time trying to decide what food to order at restaurants or what cars to buy. And so this is all bad. This is all bad. It needs to be regulated and be made socially responsible. And so, and so but, but like I said, those are lawyers. And so we expect that kind of idiocy from lawyers who, who, who uh, talk about uh, economic subjects and, and try to justify their existence somehow at the universities. But, uh, but for an economist to say this in this day and age is truly ridiculous um, as far as that goes. And so that's homogeneous products. Now, the many firms' uh, ex uh, assumption of the model uh, that uh, that caused uh, endless mischief because uh, that meant the, uh, competition or monopoly rather. The definition of monopoly historically meant government created monopoly. It always meant that the, the whole common law developed uh, in Britain for for decades and decades, generations uh, treated monopoly as a grant from the government, and that's that's how it was always thought of and until you know around the, the late 19th, early 20th century. All of a sudden, bigness became a definition of monopoly, and then with the incorporation of this model, the uh, the perfect competition model, uh, that well, that enshrined uh, the idea that uh, the number of firms is a measuring rod of competition. Remember the the quotes I gave you from Richard T. Ely and John Bates Clark in the late 1800s, early 20th century. Uh, they didn't see any problem with the fact that there were uh, fewer firms today in, in some industries than there were five years ago. Because what did they see? Well, they saw costs going down and prices to consumers going down as a result. So what's the problem? It's competition, as they saw. It's, it's evolutionary. That all changed, of course. And, uh, and so this, this uh, assumption of many firms was enshrined in the literature of economics in something called the market concentration doctrine. And the market concentration doctrine made a simple assumption. The assumption was that fewer firms makes it easier for collusion to happen uh, and for cartels to form. Therefore, fewer firms leads to monopoly. And so, uh, just, and so the government uh, adopted all these measuring uh, sticks of monopoly, such as a four-firm concentration ratio, uh, eight-firm concentration ratio. And these were such uh, defined as uh, the... the percentage of sales made by the four largest firms, for example. That would be a four-firm concentration ratio. There was uh, Abba Lerner, the socialist who, who debated Mises on, on, on the socialist calculation debate. He came up with an index, of the Lerner index, which uh, purported to measure the extent to which price diverged from marginal cost. And that, that, well, that's another index that the government uh, use, uses sometimes and has used to try to go on its hunts for monopoly, which are really hunts for deviations from nirvana, from, uh, from, from perfect competition. And so, and so this was the heart and soul of antitrust regulation for many, many years, this measuring rod of many firms. Many firms good, fewer firms bad. That's, that's, probably, probably, that's about the level of scientific uh, 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 discussion on the at the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. And this, this held sway in policy circles from the, roughly the 1940s until the 1980s. But there was a, a bit of a revolution in economics. Uh, and the way the, the revolution took place is that there were some people at the Chicago School who rediscovered the Austrian view of competition. Uh, of course, they never gave the Austrians any credit for it. They never called themselves Austrians. They never quoted the Austrians. But every bit of it was thoroughly Austrian in that it looked at competition as a dynamic, rivalrous process and said, wait a minute, these antitrust policies are actually bad. They're actually harming competition. And so and, uh, they even gave it a name. The Chicago schoolers gave this a name called the New Learning. And although it wasn't, it was the old learning. It was the rediscovery of the old Austrian view of competition but uh, since they were competing for prestige within the economics profession, they couldn't give credit to where it was really due. They just had to say, well, this is our idea, uh, which it really wasn't. It's Adam Smith's idea, uh, you know, really. And so, uh, and so I brought one more table of numbers. I'm going to put it up, and uh, uh, you need to memorize all these numbers because it's going to be the first question on the exam at the end of the week. <laughs> and, uh, and whoever doesn't get them all right uh, cannot go on to the oral exam. Okay, that's it. That's, uh, <laughs> Uh, 
But again, I, I guess the front row could maybe read this, but I'll put this up so that you know I'm not making numbers up. Uh, this is from a book, and this is a, one example I'm going to give of this revolution I'm talking about, where it, the economics profession came around to the Austrian view of competition by looking at it as a more, in more, as a more dynamic, rivalrous process rather than a, as an end state or an equilibrium state. And this is a book by Yale Brozen, B-R-O-Z-E-N. His first name is Yale, just like Yale University. And the title of the book is Concentration, Mergers, and Public Policy. It was written in the, uh, I think, 1983, around there. And it was a summary of this uh, Chicago school research, mostly his, uh, up to that point. And this, this is an example of the type of uh, thing that really turned the economics profession around and turned public policy around for years uh, it's, it's gone back downhill now, but uh, it really was effective. And, and so what this is, is um, there were all these studies, mostly coming out of Harvard, uh, and Harvard economists, saying that uh, industrial concentration, that is industries where there are fewer firms with a high market share, leads to monopoly. And so they did all these statistical tests finding correlations between industrial concentration on the one hand and the high profits on the other hand, higher than normal profits. And they assumed that uh, the, cause, the uh, correlation was causation under the theory that industrial concentration makes uh, the formation of cartels easier, therefore the cause of the higher profitability is monopoly. Uh, well, what does the, you know, your common understanding of competition say? What well, says, well, if there's above average profits being earned in one industry, Entry will occur. People from all over the world will start competing uh, for those profits, and that will eventually drive down the, the level of profits, the competition. That's what competition does if you look at it over time, okay, dynamic, as I said. But if you look, if you take a snapshot, you know, of course, at any one time, it's true that somebody's going to be the best. Somebody's going to have a big market share in, in just about every industry, bigger than everybody else, and above average profitability. So if you take a snapshot or equilibrium view, yeah, you always find somebody's the best. Uh, uh, you know, the New Orleans Saints are the best in the NFL as of now. They won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Okay, but over time, you think the Saints are a pretty crappy team. You know, if you look at the, you know, their fans used to put paper bags over their heads, literally. They, they call them the Aints. For years and years, they call them the Aints. And so, yeah, if you look at just, just the year 2009, well, that's the greatest team. Who could ever beat the Saints? No one will ever beat the Saints. Let's send the Federal Trade Commission in there to, to New Orleans. You know, you know, do something about this. Uh, but in, and that's basically what Brozen did with American manufacturing. He took all the same industries that the Harvard economists were looking at in, in, at a snapshot, at a point in time, and saying, aha, there's monopoly here, look at this, they're making above average profits. And I'll read a few of these to show you what he's doing here. Like, as I said, only the people in the front row can, uh, can see this, probably. But what, what he has here is percentage return on book net worth on two peaks of the business cycle. Uh, 1948 and 1956. So he, he didn't want to have, you know, one set of data for a recession and then another for a, a boom. You know, he wanted to try to control the best he could for general economic conditions. And so, uh, you know, the first one he has listed is lumber, uh, percentage return on uh, net worth 29.3 down to 12.6, and then he ranks them. So lumber, lumber in that year happened to be uh, the number one profitable industry. That's because of the post-war housing boom, I assume. And so, but by 1956, lumber went from first to 20th, and then appliances, the housing boom, appliances, washing machines, and so forth, went from the second most profitable to 25th, and then textiles went from third to uh, 39th. You had automobiles went from fourth to 12th, and so forth. And so, and this is true, in, in all these big, these two tables of statistics, what generally happened during this relatively short period of time is that the most profitable industries, uh, their profit rates uh, descended toward the median, and the less profitable industries as ascended, they, they moved up, and they ascended toward, toward the median. And you can see this, and he does it in the book also for different time periods, not just 1948 and 56, and he goes up to the 1970s in, uh, in, later on in the book. And so in manufacturing, which had been condemned as, 
as hopelessly monopolistic, you know, you know, between all the product differentiation and all the, uh, the mergers, you know, my God, it's a monopolistic monster is what, is what we learned from Paul Samuelson at MIT and the Harvard, uh, economists who did all these, uh, concentration uh, studies. And, uh, but this, this was like a big stink bomb right in Harvard Yard, this, 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 uh, this article this, from this book, because it really, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I used to, Teach industrial organization at the PhD level at George Mason, and in, in the days when a lot of this was happening, and uh, and, and I read all of this literature, and they were in a panic. It was kind of fun to read some of these articles. They're desperate to defend their human capital, but uh, people like Harold Demsetz and Yale Brosen uh, just keep com coming at them. And then uh, Dom Armentano, uh, who's an Austrian, published his book Antitrust and Monopoly, uh, where he demonstrated that the, the the top 55 federal antitrust cases. Uh, in American history up to that point, early 80s, uh, in every single case, companies were cutting costs, cutting prices, creating new products, innovating, expanding output, doing all the opposite things of what the standard theory says monopolists do. Every single one, all 55. Uh, Armentano shows that in, in, in this book, which uh, I think there's an abridged version of it for sale downstairs. So, and so that, that's, that's one of the things that Brosen did. And, and that it really did turn things around, but the key to it was uh, uh, looking at competition dynamic over time. Uh, if you take if you take just a snapshot view, well, of course um, you're going to get that view. And here's another another thing that that happened. I'll put this uh, monopoly diagram back on. The economics profession uh, uh, started trying to measure the cost of monopoly, the social cost of monopoly. There's a big big uh, literature on that. And basically, uh, much of it started out trying to get statistical estimates of this triangle right here. This is called the welfare triangle in the, in the monopoly model. It's the loss of consumer surplus due to the output restriction from here, Q competition to Q monopoly. And so uh, I think the very first article was published by uh, Arnold Harberger in the American Economic Review in 1954. And he came up with one-tenth of one percent of GDP. And so there were the big red panic button in, at Harvard University at the economics department was pushed uh, because they, they had spent uh, careers uh, uh, developing market failure models of monopolistic competition in every conceivable way in which markets deviate from nirvana or utopia. And here comes uh, Arnold Harberger at the University of Chicago saying, well, yeah, even if we believe all these models of how awful industry is, it's only one-tenth of one percent of GDP, and that's probably uh, not even the amount of time economists spend studying monopoly, <laughs> that, as far as, so what's, you know, what's the problem? And so panic, you know, set in, had to set in. And so, uh, and they're, they're kept getting more and more uh, papers published like this, and the, the estimates went up to, you know, maybe five or six percent, or something like that. But as is true with all econometric work, it's endless. It's just endless. It, it, it creates careers for economists, but it rarely ever settles much of anything. It's just endless debates over uh, omitted variables and all the all the hundreds of things you can you can argue over in economics journals and make a career out of it uh, without ever learning anything uh, or teaching anybody anything. It reminds me of my colleague who I was so excited, the best, biggest day of his life. He, he had an article accepted in the Journal of Finance, which if you're, if you're in the area of corporate finance and academe, that's the big journal. And I asked him, well, what will we know about uh, finance now that we did not know before your uh, paper was published? He said, nothing. He said, nothing. I just uh, tweaked uh, an econometric technique that somebody had, else had developed and showed that uh, it could be tweaked. And, uh, but, uh, but it really says nothing about finance per se. And so, so, and so that's how a lot of the careers are made in the field of economics and finance. But, um, but, but this whole technique, this whole technique, this all assumes equilibrium. This is an equilibrium model. And so what, what these people did is uh, they used data gathered by the U.S. Commerce Department. That's who gathers data on, on these industries. They always use Commerce Department data. That means that they assume that on the day the uh, Commerce Department bureaucrat made a phone call to uh, IBM or whoever and, and asked them, what are you charging for your computers today? They assumed that everything was in long-run equilibrium. 
Okay, and so they get all this data. The assumption is that all these prices and all this cost data is long-run equilibrium costs and long-run equilibrium prices, and none of these markets are in disequilibrium. It has to be the assumption if you apply that data to this model to measure uh, uh, to measure this. And uh, and so anyway, uh, an, an economist who's an Austrian, Steve Littlechild, a British economist, uh, he published an article in the Economics Journal where he took a close look at the original Harberger article. And I'd read this in graduate school, but I didn't catch this one passage from it, I guess. Uh, you know, at least when I went to graduate school, they gave us an overwhelming reading list. It was like humanly impossible for anybody to read all this stuff uh, 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 at one time. And so uh, you, you had to try to economize. And I, this must have been one of the areas where I economized, didn't read that this particular passage. But Harberger uh, admitted in this paper, as did others in this, this literature, that um, you know he's trying to measure monopoly profits in his thing. He assumed, he wrote right in the article, that we have no way of knowing whether these profits we're trying to measure are equilibrium profits or disequilibrium profits. But we're going to assume that they're all equilibrium profits. Yeah. And so, of course, disequilibrium profits could just be, well, a product comes on the market, and it's very popular, it catches on, and everybody wants it. Uh, there's no monopoly there, but everybody wants it. It's a popular new product. And then competition eventually comes in, and the price goes down, and, and, and the profits go down. And, but here we're saying, no, we're assuming that the, any profits we see that are above normal are, are, are equilibrium monopoly profits. That way we can increase the estimate of our uh, 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 deadweight loss of monopoly and, and so forth, and profits of monopoly. And uh, other authors did that, too. They saw, um, Steve Littlechild quoted uh, uh, Dennis Mueller again and Keith Cowling, who wrote another article in the Economic Journal, saying the same thing. So it's just, uh, I wouldn't call it dishonest, because they admitted that they're, what they were doing. They didn't hide this. They said, we, we, we admit that we don't know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> and so they were very honest about it. They did it. They just say that. We don't know if, we hadn't the clue whether this is equilibrium or disequilibrium. And so these, all these studies are pretty much worthless. Um, although they did make many careers, like my friend in the finance journal, they big long resumes from all these, all these guys who wrote these. Um, homogeneous prices, uh, that, you know, that assumption, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons why firms don't all charge the same prices uh, for things. Uh, example I often sometimes give in a, in a class would be uh, when I lived in downtown Baltimore for a while, I lived in a townhouse. And uh, advertisers, local businesses, would uh, hire uh, these guys. Uh, they're like SWAT teams. A van would pull up in front of your house, and the three or four guys would jump out the back, and they're carrying paper sacks with advertising flyers for pizza joints. And they would go door to door and put all the flyers in your mailbox. So I'd get home at night, and there'd be a giant pile of paper uh, in front of my door with advertising things like... Uh, the newest pizza joint in town is, is now open. Uh, come and get a large pizza, a 32-ounce Coke, and a sub sandwich for $5.99 or some, something ridiculous like that. And so, uh, and they would do that for the first couple of weeks just to get people in the door. Because how do you compete uh, when, you're, when you're new in a business like that? You have to get people to come and try out your pizza. Uh, well, how do you do that? Well, you offer them a good deal. That's how you do that. You, you don't just put a sign up and say, boy, my pizza is much better than that guy down there. Well, you know, who says? Uh, give them an incentive. And so that's typically what would happen. There, so there are a lot of reasons why you see different prices charged all the time. But uh, according to the, uh, the standard model, though, this is a monopoly model. If price is ever above marginal cost, that's a no-no. That's, that's a, you know, hit the, hit the alarm button. That's a, a potential monopoly. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave, leave that for now. And, um, in terms of, you know, the real, the real source of a monopoly has always been government, as I said. And even this, this output restriction idea, uh, Rothbard is, is sort of entertaining as always when he talks about it in his chapter in Man, Economy, and State. Uh, when you look at the output restriction idea, uh, one, one serious, um, you know, he's not, not totally entertaining, but, but one really good point he makes is that, okay, they're saying, uh, welfare is reduced by output restriction. Well, if, if this industry is using fewer resources than it otherwise would because of this output restriction, those resources are being put to work somewhere else. They'll be bid away by other entrepreneurs, uh, the labor and the materials and so forth, to do other things. So this means that by definition, there'll be an expansion of output somewhere else, even though there's a reduction of output here. And so how could you say unequivocally there's a reduction in welfare 
if there's an expansion somewhere else. He just takes it. Uh, and then, then there's sort of a reductio ad absurdum to all this. Um, uh, how many of you watch the Ultimate Fighting on, uh, on TV? Some of the guys are probably fans. Any women uh, fans of Ultimate Fighting? How about Ultimate Mud Wrestling? Anybody? <laughs> Do they have that? Uh, that would be a good one. Maybe we should... It's an entrepreneurial idea. But, 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 but you know, the Ultimate Fighting guys, they, they just beat each other's brains in. If you ever watched it, it's, it's much more vicious than uh, the Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, Frazier type of boxing. These guys really you know, kill, break each other's arms, literally, and legs, things like that. And how often do these guys fight, do you think? Who watches? Who's a fan? We've got a fan here. Who wants to take a guess? How often do they do this? It's pretty brutal. In, in the, how often? How often? How often? Yeah, how about? Two or three times if you're, you're a fighter. Yeah, you have to be in top condition. You have to be as strong as you can get. Because they really, it's a really grueling thing if you ever watch it. So two or three times a year. Well, they're obviously restricting output, aren't they? Two or three times a year. Why don't they fight like Brad Pitt did in that movie Fight Club? He's, every night. <laughs> Every night they were down there, bare knuckles too, uh, fighting. And you know, now that was a perfect, perfectly competitive fight, uh, fight club there every single night. And so, and so you could, when you look at this whole idea of output restriction as a, a measuring rod of monopoly, it can get really ridiculous. And, and the policymakers have made it ridiculous. An uh, example, I will, I'll probably will never forget this because it, it was just a, such a caricature of the lunacy of this idea. There was a, a guy from the Federal Trade Commission giving a talk at a conference in D.C. on antitrust, and he was bragging about all the wonderful things they were doing. And he said uh, in Detroit, the, the automobile dealers were uh, shutting down at 5 p.m. in the wintertime in Detroit, all of them. So if you wanted to buy a car after work in the city of Detroit, and this was 20 years ago, uh, you couldn't. And they were, and he said the FTC was investigating this because they thought they were colluding to restrict output by closing down at five o'clock, uh, in the winter, in the winter time. And so, uh, and, and I, I asked him, I was the one, I stood up and asked him, uh, does this, does this mean that, uh, forced labor is a prerequisite for economic efficiency? Because that's really what you're saying. You know, what are they going to do? Tell these guys you have to stay at work until nine o'clock? Uh, you know, that would be forced labor. Uh, that would be like slavery. You know, the, you, you want to, it's your business, you own it, you want to go home at five o'clock and have dinner. No, the government says you've got to stay there till nine. What is that? Conscription. And so, uh, he had, he was just totally silent. He, um, he'd never thought of that before, but he, he was so self-congratulatory in his presentation, he, he, uh, you know, he not really thought about that. And so, uh, but that's, but that's true. Uh, that would be true. It's, it's a form of conscription if you, if you, if you look at it that way. And, uh, Another uh, point that Rothbard makes uh, in his analysis of this is, uh, you know, most economists talk about consumer sovereignty and the loss of consumer welfare from the output restriction, but uh, Rothbard says, well, he makes the case for individual sovereignty. And uh, in other words, uh, it's, it's a property rights approach, property rights-based approach, because, you know, here's a business owner, private business owner, uh, and he, he or she can do whatever they want with their, their property as long as they don't harm somebody with it. And so... Uh, you know, who's to say that the well-being of the consumer should always take precedence over the well-being of the business owner, who's just doing with uh, with his own property, trying to make as much money as he can with his own property? Uh, you know, why is the consumer always the more important? And so, and that's that's a good example of how a bias sneaks into economics under the guise of science, under the guise of positivism and, and unbiased uh, work, but that is a by that. You are making a statement about what you think the appropriate system of property rights is. You're saying that uh, the average consumer should have uh, um, uh, um, superior property rights to the average business owner in here, and even though it's, not, it's never made explicit by economists. Well, well like I said, government is, has always been the source of monopoly, and um, I'm teaching an online course on the road to serfdom right now through the Mises Academy, and, uh, and by the way, if anyone wants to lose weight, do what I did last night. Go up to Marty Rockwell's office and sit there for about an hour and a half at about 6 p.m. after the, the heat has come through the skylight all afternoon right there. It's like a sauna up, up there. And so if, if you think it's cold in every other, every other room in this whole building, it's freezing. And where I go to teach my class with the door shut to keep the noise out, it must have been 120 degrees in there. Look <laughs> at the skylight with the sun beating down. But, but anyway... Uh, but anyway, here's uh, Friedrich Hayek in his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, uh, t talks about monopoly in a number of places. 
Uh, and he says this, Monopoly, this was published in 1944, monopolists regularly seek and frequently obtain the assistance of the power of the state to make their control effective. Everybody knows that. He says the United States and Germany, he, he, he says the growth of cartels and syndicates has since 19, 1878 been systematically fostered by deliberate policy. So he's talking about Germany and the United States, and he says, yes, there's, there's been monopoly, but it's been deliberate policy. How has it been deliberate policy? Well, I'll, I'll, I can read to you how so-called natural monopolies were created in the utilities industry. Here's an example of how exactly natural monopolies came about. There's nothing natural about it. There's nothing free market about it. There were many competitors in the telephone industry, the electric power industry, natural gas, water supply. Uh, they never did monopolize. But there's a book and an article of mine called The Myth of Natural Monopoly. I uh, cited a book called The Gaslight Company of Baltimore. And believe it or not, uh, Richard T. Ely has a lot to do with this. Richard T. Ely was in Baltimore teaching at Johns Hopkins, and he wrote a whole bunch of articles on the, the electric power and uh, in the light industry of his time. And a lot of these, a lot of this uh, made it into this book that I that I dug up and, and explained how natural monopoly, so-called, came about. And here's how it came about. In 1890, a bill was introduced into the Maryland legislature, which called for an annual payment to the city from the Consolidated Gas Company, it's, it's now called Baltimore Gas and Electric, of $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly, end quote. And this is what happened all over America. Governments created 25 or 30-year monopolies by law and then, and of course, they allowed them to charge monopoly prices, and then they split the loot with the politicians. 3% of all profits, plus a $10,000 a year signing bonus for the politicians, for signing the law into law. And so, and that's how so-called natural monopolies, they're not a, the, the story that, the, that you were all miseducated in if you took microeconomics was that Economies of scale were, were becoming prevalent, and one big firm was dominating all these industries. Therefore, uh, polit some politician, some local politician of the mayor or the governor, got on his big white horse and rode in and saved the consumer from monopoly. That's not how it happened. That's a myth. Even though you're taught that in your economics books, it's a myth. It never happened like that. This is how it happened. Uh, and and, and uh, other examples, a few more examples of you know the real source of monopoly in American history anyway, uh, well... The railroad and trucking industries were monopolized for many, many years through the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the first head of it was the president of a railroad corporation. And guess what? They regulated prices at monopolistic levels for decades. Uh, the same with the Civil Aeronautics Board. Uh, there were more airlines in America in the 1930s than there were in the 1970s. The Civil Aeronautics Board was a regulatory agency that uh, reduced the competition in, in airlines. Uh, and, and they, they literally made price competition illegal. Uh, they, the government set the prices for airfares. That's, that's why they were eventually deregulated in the late, late 70s. And you know, one of the rare good things that happened in American uh, economic history as far as deregulation goes. But, uh, but the stories are legendary about how back in those days in the 50s, the, the main flyer, main people who flew on the airlines were businessmen, mostly men. Very few women were, as a, I've seen the statistics on this, like business school graduates in 1970 versus 2010 or 2000, and it's like 3% versus 55%. So back in the 50s, there were very few women flying. And so it was illegal to compete by price, and so what the airlines did was they competed uh, by quality. And the type of quality was free booze and uh, flight attendants dressed like Playboy bunnies. It was, a fa it was like every airline was like Hooters Air. Every, every, single, every, every single one of them. And I, I tried to look, I looked this up on the web once, and there are, there are whole books written about this with pictures of these, these women dressed like cheerleaders and things like you know, flight attendants. But that's, that's how they competed. So, you, so even government, you know, government can never totally eliminate competition. No matter how hard it tries, somebody will get, a, get, get around it. But they did this for many, many years. But that's how it felt. Antitrust, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, but, uh, uh, one of my articles that I published uh, many years ago in the International Review of Law and Economics is one where I looked at the origins of the Sherman Act. Uh, because I was an economics major in school, I got a PhD, I was teaching for a few years, and it struck me that I never saw evidence of this story 
that there was monopoly in the late 19th century to justify the Sherman Act. I'd, heard, I'd seen it written over and over and over and over again, but where's the evidence? And so, uh, and I found out that no one had ever done this. Uh, no one had ever uh, sought published evidence anywhere. And so I, I just looked at the two most prevalent things that economists talk about. What was happening to production output and what was happening to prices in these industries that were accused of being monopolies uh, in the decade prior to the Sherman Act, 1880 to 1890. And uh, what I found was that uh, in terms of outputs, GDP was expanding by, I think it was uh, 7 or 8 percent during that decade, or not, or not 7 or 8 more than that, maybe like 3 percent a year for a decade. It's a pretty good expansion. But these industries that were uh, accused of being monopolies expanded their output by 175 percent during the decade prior to the Sherman Act. This was a period of price deflation. Prices went down on average by 7%. All of these industries for a decade were cutting their prices faster than, than the general economy. So these were the most uh, rapidly expanding, dynamic, vigorously price-cutting industries for decades, and they were targeted as being monopolies, which they weren't. They were just fierce competitors. They were excellent competitors. John D. Rockefeller made his money by dropping the price of refined kerosene down almost to nothing. That's how he made his money. That's how you make big money in, in manufacturing, F figure out how to sell uh, large volumes to the masses. And that's what these entrepreneurs did. And so even, even the, the story of where the, the antitrust laws came from and why they were necessary, I argue, is false. And I write about this in my book also, uh, How Capitalism Saved America, which is for sale. And for an extra $10, you can get my autograph on, on the, uh, downstairs. And time is up.